Hello and welcome to VR Essentials. This is a series of videos I've put together designed to tell you everything you need to know about virtual reality so you can make an informed decision whether or not VR is for you. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at cockpit interaction. Get a VR headset and you're able to immerse yourself in an amazing 3D world. But how do you interact? with that 3D environment around you and what options are available to you right now. Welcome to The Sim Hangar. My name's Mark. Thanks for watching and let's get started. You may be surprised at the number of options and choices available for you to interact with your 3D world in virtual reality. We can't cover them all in detail. That's beyond the scope of this video, but we can have a look at what's available. We'll cover the traditional keyboard, mouse, and so on, as well as look at the use of controllers in virtual reality. But we're going to take it one step further and look at some more advanced options, such as voice control, maybe a bespoke cockpit, finger tracking technology, as well as a few others. Just a reminder that this video has a focus on Microsoft Flight Simulator and the HP Reverb headset. However, the general principles and guidance applies across the board no matter what headset or sim you're using. If you'd like to know more about the Virtual Reality Essential series of videos, I'll leave a link to the playlist in the notes below. In part one, we looked at what's the attraction of VR, and we also had a look at the current lineup for hardware and headsets, along with some recommendations. In part two, we tackled the issue of VR motion sickness whilst in the VR headset. We had a look at what caused it and what we can do to reduce or eliminate the effects of motion sickness. In part three, we looked at the role of third-party lenses in VR and the potential benefits of anti-glare and blue light filters even for those that don't wear glasses. Having recently ordered a pair, we also looked at what do you get and how do you fit them to the VR headset. I'm very happy with my purchase and I got them from a company, VR Wave, with both blue light and anti-glare filters. My only real regret? Well, I should have done it sooner. Following the release of the video, I've been in contact with VR Wave and I'm pleased to announce a 5% discount if you decide to purchase a set of lenses. During the purchasing process, you'll get an opportunity to enter a discount code. Enter SimHanger exactly as shown, all lowercase, and your discount will be applied. My thanks to VR Wave for accepting this request. Getting ready to fly in VR doesn't really take up more space than flying on the flat screen. Got access to my keyboard if I need it, but I try and avoid it. I use both my yoke and throttle quadrant. Whilst in VR, my headset's connected to the PC and ready to be put on. The only real change I make is I don't want to lean over the throttle quadrant to the desk to use the mouse. So I use a small table that's on wheels for the mouse. Makes access easier and control better. And that, in a nutshell, is my setup for VR. Before we dive into VR, there's a couple of configurations we need to set up. From the Options menu, General Options, and then we're going to select VR mode. And once selected, it will display a number of configurations which are going to be important. The ones indicated are the default keyboard assignments. Accessing the keyboard, and in particular multiple keys, is going to be very difficult in VR because we've got our headset on. So it's always a good idea to assign these to whatever controller that you're using. The first one is either enter or exit VR mode. Secondly, to give you access to the top toolbar, which you may need to change the weather or something. And VR camera reset, which sits you back in the pilot seat. It's a quick way to get yourself realigned in the VR cockpit. You'll find this function essential, especially when you first enter your cockpit. In this instance, I'm using the Honeycomb Alpha Flight Joke. And as you can see, the three functions, camera reset, the toolbar activator, and activate or deactivate VR have been assigned to buttons on the yoke. Let's now have a quick look at some of the more common methods used for interacting with our cockpit. Let's enter VR mode first. As indicated earlier, I've got a toggle switch set up on my yoke. Pressing it left takes me in and out of VR and pressing it right displays the VR toolbar. Let's get into VR. 
We're now in VR and I need to hit the camera reset button to centralize my position. Done, I'm now in the pilot seat. Whilst flying in VR I use both my yoke and my throttle quadrant. They're right in front of me, so they're relatively easy to find. The yoke is easy but the throttle is a little bit more challenging. But your brain quickly clicks in after a couple of tries and you instinctively know where everything is. I'm able to reach down and adjust the throttle or the mixture no problem. Using the mouse in VR is almost exactly the same as using it in monitor or 2D mode. Move your mouse over something and it highlights and then you can activate it. Here I'm putting the taxi lights on and off for example. I'm activating by using the left mouse button. I'm now adjusting the heading and I can do that by using the middle mouse wheel and simply rotating it. The other option is I can click and hold on it and then drag the mouse left and right for faster changes. You'll find using the mouse in VR fairly straightforward and somewhat instinctive if you've used Sims before. Let's now turn to using our controllers. Pressing the trigger either on the left or right controller will activate that controller. And pretty much as you did with the mouse, you can move and highlight a particular function. In this case it's the heading and I just rotate the controller. Here I'm using the throttle, press the trigger and move the controller frontwards or backwards. But you're not limited to using just one controller. With the left controller I've grabbed the yoke and keeping the trigger pressed down. With my right controller I can activate the throttle. You could interact with the cockpit without using your peripherals at all, just the two controllers. But you may well find that it's a little bit clunky and not very intuitive to use. Here for example I'm flying using just one controller, not using my peripherals. The controller has a joystick on it and I can move the joystick up and down to change the elevators or bank left and right. Whilst flying I can still interact with the cockpit by highlighting something with the controller and so on. Each person has their own preferred method. For me, I prefer using the mouse rather than the controller. Using the mouse in conjunction with my peripherals I find to be easier. Having a controller in your hand and trying to operate the yoke as well as the throttle, well it's very difficult indeed. But the controllers can give you haptic feedback, so some may prefer that. It's a matter of personal choice. Back to my mouse now and I've found myself in difficult weather. I now click my toggle switch to show the top toolbar. I've decided to change the weather so I can see where I'm going. And I can now interact with the menu options as required. I've changed the weather to clear skies, close the menu and then I can activate or deactivate the top toolbar by once again using the toggle switch. Accessing the keyboard commands for this would be awkward and require me to come out of VR which would break the immersion. Thus my earlier recommendation that you configure some functions to your controller. Some headsets have what we call a pass through mode. And this is where the cameras on your headset actually function as a camera and you can see your actual environment around you. Not all headsets have this function. However, clicking in and out of the pass-through mode is not really very helpful. Often the resolution of the pass-through mode is fairly low, and of course it breaks the immersion. The vast majority of people flying in VR will utilize a mouse or a controller in conjunction with their yoke or joystick or whatever control method they prefer. Whilst not being able to see your joystick or your yoke may seem awkward at first, but you very soon get the hang of it. Muscle memory kicks in and you find you're able to find things fairly easily, including autopilot controls and the relevant switches. Talking of switches, perhaps your peripheral or device that you're using doesn't have enough switches available for you to carry out all the functions that you want. Or gaining access to those buttons or switches is difficult. Well, there are a number of other devices available to give you more options. And I'm not able to cover them all here, but one that's gaining popularity and fairly quickly at the moment, and not only for flying in VR but also for flying using the monitor, is a Stream Deck. Designed ideally for those that are streaming on Twitch and such like, a Stream Deck is essentially just a panel of configurable buttons. The example I'm using in this video is the Stream Deck from Elgato, a company renowned for their quality. And as you can see it comes in various sizes, so you can have as little as 6 
or a whole lot more buttons depending on your preference. And as mentioned earlier, popular not only for VR but for monitor flying as well. These devices have become popular simply because of their ease of use and how easy they are to configure. So much so that on the popular website flightsim.to there's already multiple configurations for many different aircraft and the display icons on the individual buttons can be configured to suit. If that sort of thing doesn't suit you, well there's always the option to interact via voice. And particularly if you're keen on flying the larger aircraft, arguably this is more immersive and realistic as well. And this technology in the last couple of years has come on leaps and bounds. There's quite a wide range of different options for implementing voice within Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'm only going to focus on one or two. A program called Voice Attack has been around for quite some time and is continually being developed. In essence, it allows you to configure various actions to voice commands. This can be as simple as gear up, right through to system preparation and checks, as well as navigational controls. You'll find it remarkably versatile in prices while well, it's around the US 10 mark. If you don't want the hassle of setting up voice attack and configuring all the controls, well, help is here, with the add-on packs designed to work with voice attack, and is from a company called HCS Voice Packs. There's a number of different voice packs available, from Copilot Elise through to Captain Williams and Captain Anderson. These are pre-configured for the normal controls, but they can be edited as well. Let's have a quick listen to Copilot Elise running through some pre-flight checks. Complete the checklist now if you wish. Yes, go ahead. Parking brake is on. Confirmed. Set battery to on. Turning external power on. Set APU to start. Set APU generator on. If you'd like to know more about how to use voice attack and HDS voice packs, check out Pie in the Skies video link in the notes below. Raise landing gear. Raising gear. Retract flaps. Retract flaps. Engage autopilot. Autopilot on. It is a really fun tool to have and I find myself using it more and more when flying in VR. Here's some examples of me using it in VR in various situations. Contact ATC. ATC. Disengage autopilot. Autopilot is now on. She's all yours. No problem, I have it. Turn off the seatbelt sign. That's off. My thanks to Chris, Pie in the Sky and HCS for allowing me to use excerpts from their videos. There are of course other voice options available, and these tend to be more bespoke, such as those provided by FS2 Crew. FS2 Crew is a standalone option, and their Microsoft Flight Simulator range includes for the fly-by-wire A320 and the new release for the CRJ. Gotta say, this is one that I'm particularly interested in. This is voice-activated software and pack-in-one designed particularly for the CRJ. Once again, highly configurable, multiple accents included, and an option for button control if you prefer it that way. FS2 crew have been around a while and create voice packs for other sims as well. Voice interaction, of course, is ideal for anybody using motion platforms, such as those from Yaw and their Yaw 2 motion platform. If you think about it, voice in VR just makes a whole lot of sense. Moving on now. The other option, of course, particularly suitable for those that don't fly a wide variety of different aircraft on a regular basis, is a bespoke cockpit, built for VR. What I mean by bespoke cockpit is that all the peripherals are positioned exactly where they are in the actual aircraft. So when you're in VR, you can just reach out and you know exactly where that button or throttle is. Authenticit is a company that does just that and currently specialising in the World War II warbirds, though other aircraft are under development. I've produced a number of videos in the past covering the Authenticate equipment, and I'll leave links to these videos in the notes below if you'd like to know more. 
but in summary they offer freeware plans that will allow you to get the product 3D printed or alternatively will give you a source where you can purchase these items. You can then assemble the units yourself. I'm a big fan of Flying Iron Spitfire Mark 9. And here I am using the Authenticate equipment to set up a bespoke cockpit for the Spitfire, including the throttle quadrant, elevator and rudder trim that all connect via a simple hub and then to the PC, as well as the iconic spade flight stick, including brake and trigger. The position of these items exactly match what's in the cockpit. As always, links to Authenticate in the notes below. Of course what we'd all like to do is the ability just to reach out and interact directly in our cockpit with our hands. And if we're able to get some force feedback or haptic feedback, well that would just be ideal. And when the hands are directly in front of the controller, I must say that the accuracy is quite amazing. As you can see, it's tracking all finger movements exactly. However, when one moves to the sides, then the accuracy of that tracking um, is not quite as good. An example of hand or finger tracking was from my early days on YouTube, using the Leap Motion, or as they're now known as Ultra Leap, hand tracking sensor. And the test wasn't done in Microsoft Flight Simulator at that time. As you can see from the insert picture, the sensor is attached to the VR headset and allows for hand tracking and interaction within the cockpit. Some of the more expensive VR headsets, and especially those aimed at enterprise level business, incorporate hand tracking. Some hand tracking methods have also incorporated the use of a glove, but they tend to be bulky and expensive. Hand tracking technology is not new. It's been around for quite a while, but the adoption has tended to be at the upper end of the market, but this is slowly starting to change. The recent introduction of the OpenXR Toolkit, a piece of freeware developed by a gentleman called Matt, will incorporate the ability for hand tracking. And it may soon be time for me to get my sensor back out the box and give it another go. If you'd be interested in following me along as I do my trial and tests, let me know in the comments below. The different ways of interacting with the VR cockpit are not exhaustive in this video. There are others that we just haven't had time to cover. But I think it does demonstrate there's a wide variety of options available. And not only does this make VR more practical, but more immersive and more realistic. If you're considering VR or you're into VR already, then investigation of some of these options could well prove to be beneficial and suit your flying style. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you found this interesting and informative. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to see more like this. Stay well, take care, I'll see you on the next one and bye for now.